This event is sponsored by the Brattleboro Area Interfaith Initiative, and we are very grateful that you've come to hear this evening about the refugee crisis. We have two speakers, um, Jennifer Silverstone, who's listed on the um, poster, isn't able to be here, and I'm going to read this little short note that she sent me. Dear Mary, unfortunately, I have decided I cannot make the trek to Vermont on Saturday. It is not fair to my family being gone an entire Saturday and then Sunday. And, and Sunday we have obligations and my husband leaves that night for international travel and then comes back the same day that I leave for Greece and that's just on this coming Friday. It was a difficult decision to make because I wanted to be part of this event and I also have seen all the hard work that's being done. She has a three and a half year old and a five year old and is going to leave them to go to Greece in a few days, so that's why she couldn't be here. But we have Sammy and we have Inga to talk to you. So we'll start with Inga, who's from Carry Me Home. She's from Poland, and, but has lived here in Brattleboro for quite a while. And she also has two little children. So she'll tell you about Carry Me Home and then we'll have Sammy tell you about Eyes on Refugees. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Inga Paluch, and um, I am a member of Carry Me Home. Um, it's a non-for-profit organization that um, it's pretty new. We only started um, September of, of last year, of 2015, and we became non-profit um, January of this year. So very, very young organization, but we have already sent 4,400 pounds of clothing, shoes, and uh, baby carriers. Yeah. Um, everything started um, last summer when my friend uh, Vedrana Greatorex, who is uh, Croatian, originally from Croatia, went back home and uh, spoke with a friend of hers uh, who was um, traveling 45 minutes away from her home um, to deliver some food and clothes to um, Croatian-Slovenian border where a lot of the refugees were stuck because they couldn't go through. For, I mean, they were just being checked and it was taking a while. So they were there for a few days. Um, and Vedrana kind of you know, felt like she needed to do something. And when she came back here, back to the States, um, she posted on Facebook and she got some money from friends and some baby carriers. And initially she sent that money to her friend and uh, then she, pe people kept responding and just call it, giving her money. And, but the friend back home, uh, what, the situation changed and this uh, Croatian-Slovenian border was smooth. And then everything moved to Croatian-Hungarian border, which was three hours away. She had two little kids, so she couldn't travel three hours away every few days. Um, so she got us in touch with a uh, mm -hmm. non-for-profit organization uh, called um, Are You Serious? Um, who um, actually have volunteers in many countries. They are based in, um, in Croatia. And uh, we started sending them baby carriers. The first time we sent two boxes of baby carriers. Um, and then we started collecting clothing, but mostly baby, clo uh, kids clothing and baby carriers as well. Um, from there we started shipping to Slovenia. From there everything moved to Greece because we've heard the situation in Greece um, has become really um, severe where all the refugees were coming on the boats and um, with wet clothes in the winter. Uh, so we started collecting more kids clothing and packaged them where we um, we packed everything in a plastic bag so when the refugees came um, they took off all the wet clothes and the refugees could help them especially the kids help them uh, dress from sacks all from feet up so we packed uh, we packaged in a plastic bag everything that you could put on a child <laughs> Um, so I would always imagine, like, what do I put on my, on my child, from sex to all the way up. Uh, and we always included a little toy uh, for, the, for the child. Um, so that's how we, uh, we sent a lot of boxes like that. Um, 
and we always put a, a size of a, of the eye of the clothing, so they know that you can just grab it and, and, and go and help the, the ch children there. Um, so um, the situation in Greece has been changing drastically. We have to be in contact with the different organizations all the time, and we all only send to people that we know, not personally really know because we haven't met them personally, but through word of mouth. So. We work with this organization, we've been working with them great, and let's say that the needs change, and then they could they tell us about other organizations in different maybe locations. Like right now, we're actually helping this um, this woman who started um, a, a warehouse in uh, Athens, um, and she goes to a permanent camp, um, and she needs um, you know baby clothing and uh, a lot of shoes. They always need a lot of shoes. Um, and we've been sending her items there. Um, she has 20 pregnant women right now, so we need a lot of baby stuff. And uh, we're gonna try to send something for, um, you know, maybe some pregnancy items and, um, and like newborn. Um, um, we never ship anything that will cost less to buy there. Uh, the problem with a lot of European countries is that they cannot buy used clothing. Um, and baby carriers are just so expensive that there's just no way to buy it there for cheap. And we here get it for free from a lot of the families and, um, and just package and, and ship it. But shipping is pretty expensive. So that's been our struggle. That has been our struggle to collect enough funds to ship. Um, right now I've been using USPS, which was, it's been the fastest. And that's why we need it because the weather changes there. The needs change all the time. Sometimes when you're ready, like we have a box packed, and then all of a sudden the the volunteers email us like, okay, the camp was closed. You can't ship it because we have nowhere to store it. So we like we have to like now research what can we send now because everything is ready. So that's why we've been using USPS has been the fastest. It takes only a week to get it to Greece, um, and um, but it's really expensive. We've tried uh, DHL, but it didn't work that well. It wasn't actually it saved us very little money. And it was much lo longer, and then, yeah. So it was it was not worth it. Um, uh, so it's like around hundred. It cost us around hundred fifty dollars a box to mm -hmm. ship, but still mm -hmm. is less than what they would have to spend to buy stuff there. Um, so um, we meet downstairs um, Mondays and Fridays mornings. Uh, from around 9.15 to noon, often longer than noon, um, and then Wednesday evenings from 4 p.m. to 7. Um, we have probably around three, four of us are like steady, we are always there, and then we have a lot of other people coming all the time, so they rotate and help. Um, uh, we have a big event tomorrow, I w wanted to make sure that I don't forget to mention. We have an 80s event. Uh, we're going to have a DJ with 80s music. It's a family friendly event uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Brattleboro, um, the, the Vermont um, Jazz Center in Cotton Mill. Um, we're going to have a dessert bar, we're going to have some snacks, uh, great silence auction, really great items from local vendors. Uh, it's $10 to get in, five for uh, kids over four, and top of $20 for a family. So we invite everyone. If you want to spread the word, I would appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So it's now my pleasure to introduce my cousin, Sammy Abdella, and I have to tell you that when, at my daughter's Jewish wedding, Sammy read the Quran and was one of the people who helped to hold up the Hupa. Wow. So he lives in Boston, but he's um, he's from Lebanon, but has lived here a long time. So thank you, Sammy. Thank you. My name is Sammy, and I am a cousin of the beautiful woman <laughs> sitting here. Uh, uh, I came here, I immigrated here in 88. Uh, I have been here for 28 years, 29 years almost. And uh, prior to that, I lived the first half of my, uh, uh, my life, uh, first 20 years of my life uh, in Lebanon. 
uh, and I have been here for 28 years, but I'm still 21 years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my mother is Christian, my father is a Muslim Sunnah, and I was brought up by a, uh, for a short period of my life, uh, brought up by a Muslim Shia, and um, I uh, lived for a while in a boarding school in Lebanon uh, that was supported by the Germany government. We used to go to church every single day at 7.30 in the morning, whether we liked it or not. <laughs> uh, but it was awesome. It was the best year of my life. Uh, they kind of protected me from all the craziness that Lebanon was going through at uh, the point. Uh, when I came here, uh, the, the nice thing about what happened in Lebanon to me is that I had no role models whatsoever, meaning that you know, my father died when I was one year old. And there were no role models for me, so my, when I, by the time I got here, my brain was mainly fresh, was ready for new ideas. I uh, joined the Hebrew college for four years, studied Hebrew, I you know, just wanted to understand better. Uh, uh, you know, we called each other enemies, why we called each other enemies, I couldn't understand, you know, we we're all humans. So, um, the past 28 years, uh, it's been an amazing, amazing life for me. So uh, this is my country as well, uh, as much as Lebanon. I worked for big companies like, you know, uh, Fidelity and Harvard and Robeson and Gray and, you know, I work for Partners Healthcare right now. And uh, recently start having a lot of questions about where I'm going in my life. And of course, I stumbled into uh, the refugee crisis by complete chance. Uh, back in December, a friend of mine approached me, he said, uh, she said, uh, uh, do you want to donate some money for the refugees? I said, yeah, sure, what's going on? She said, this crazy woman, my partner, Jennifer, <laughs> she's going to France and she's going to a refugee camp and she wants to, uh, you know, she wants to help. But, you know, she's crazy enough, she doesn't know the language, like she doesn't know Arabic, you know, and uh, I don't know how she's going to communicate with me. I said, you know, I'll go. I don't know, how hard could it be? And of course, uh, this was Saturday afternoon, and uh, between Saturday and Thursday, the time that we traveled, we collected almost twenty-three thousand dollars. Whoa! We uh, literally we didn't carry the, the money with us, but we had it in the bank. We had a lot of people that donated a lot of stuff, medical stuff, and you know, and uh, waterproof things. You know, the the situation there, like shoes, for example, and that sort of thing. We carried this with us. And of course, by the time we got to the uh, to the entrance of the refugee camp, we stood there, and uh, I don't know, it's, as if it's, it's a shock. It's it's, a, it's an amazing like what you feel at right at the door. Your life changes completely. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't imagine what these people are going through. So uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to show you a short movie, and the short movie that I put together is our own experience, meaning that me and Jennifer. And we had a third partner, Heidi, also. Uh, this is our own experience, our own pictures, our own stories that we set and we talk to the people there. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm like, you know, what does a refugee need from a software engineer? Nothing, right? But I said, I'm going to show up and I'm going to help, right? And what we did, we, there were those two caravans, medical caravans, that attended to the people's, you know, to refugees there. So uh, Jennifer and Heidi were in one caravan, and there were a group of uh, UK doctors in another. And I stood between, like the ca one caravan here and one caravan here, and I stood right in the middle. Literally, all I did for 10 hours a day is translating, mm -hmm. because most of the people that were there were, uh, you know, spoke Arabic. Mm -hmm. And that was my job, and it made all the difference to the people there, mm -hmm. because to tell people, hey, you know, my thro I have a sore throat, they couldn't explain, because the people are, you know, uh, the other thing is they had a lot of dental issues. There was also caravan, like three caravans that, was, you know, that, that were dealing with dental issues. So uh, you, could all could, you all could help. You know, you might not think like you could do something, but, you know, if you spread the word or you say something to somebody or you raise the issue, we all could help. And it's such a luxurious life that we live over here that we take things for granted. You come back and you realize, oh, wow, I have, I have a great life here. I mean, you might not have a lot of money and you might not have a great jobs and things like this, but we have such an incredible life, incredible country that we live in. So I'm going to show you a short movie. 
And then I'm going to tell you a few of the stories that happened with us that we couldn't include in the movie. And then we're going to open it for Q&A. You can ask me any questions that you guys uh,
Uh, every time I uh, I see this movie, I feel like I'm going to break down. But uh, mm -hmm. the image is just stuck in my head. And uh, for a while, like, you know, the first day that we got there, uh, you, you can't show that you're shocked. You can't mm -hmm. show that you're devastated. You can't show that you're so broken inside. You have to be strong for them. Then you come back to the hotel and you totally break down. Like, <coughs> literally, all, the three of us, every single day that happened. Um, the children and the women are the most like affected by this. Uh, in Calais, for example, there are about 400 children that are orphaned, totally like have no fathers or mothers or anything like this. By the time they got from Greece to Calais, that's a very long journey through, you know, uh, Bulgaria, Poland, you know, Slovenia, and you know, Germany, and then they get to. LA thinking that they're going to get to UK, it's a better life, but, you know, uh, so their their family either die or something or, you know, so they get there to the, you know, the 400 children or 433 children, I think. Um, they get abused, they get raped, they get sexually, you know, molested, they beaten, they sold, you know. Uh, we, um, me and Jennifer actually, uh, we suspected at least so we partner with the group of like on the ground. We, we build relationship with them. That's why we go there, to just see their faces and they see our faces. So we, um, we end up putting a camera in one of the tents and observing the molestation and, and, you know, and the rape and that sort of thing. And what we did, we actually hired a company called Phantom Rescue to really uh, send uh, like an ex-military uh, personnel to pull out those kids out of there and put them in safe houses. But we could help one or two or three. I think we helped eight so far, but you still have, you know. And as you could see, 10,000 children are missing, like out of the 26,000 children that got into Europe. Uh, the other story that really affects me a lot, too, um, in Calais, it's mostly men. You know, you wouldn't find really, you know, very few women in Calais. Dunkirk, which is 20 minutes away from, from Calais, it is mainly uh, mainly families. You have a father and a mother, and you have four kids or five kids, but, right? Mm -hmm. I have no idea how they get there. L literally, I have I really I can't compare. I ask them, like, why do you why do you like why do you come here? And uh, when you're desperate, you're desperate. You know, and, oh, we have we could get a better life in UK, but you're not gonna get to UK. So. Uh, one of the story that affects me a lot is uh, uh, when we were in the caravans and I was standing there, a Syrian guy came to me and he said, uh, can you come with me? I really need your help. I said, sure. You don't wander around by yourself. So uh, the tent was maybe like maybe 20 or 30 yards away from the, uh, you know, from the caravans and, you know, Jennifer kept an eye on me. So I go there, I enter his tent, his wife is there, she's probably about 22 or 23 years old. And if you realize the beginning of the, you know, you know, it was really muddy and, you know, the, the mobile uh, bathrooms were there. Well, this is at the beginning. You know, you have about 14, you have about 7,000 people in the camp. It was large. In other areas, you don't have those mobile, uh, mobile uh, bathrooms. So what she would do if she wants to go to the bathroom, she goes around the tent, she does her thing, and so she comes back to the tent. He can't really be away from her, 20 or 30 yards away from her. He has to keep an eye because she could be raped, kidnapped, or, or anything like that. Those same guys that are, uh, you know, doing the molestation, the sexual stuff, they're doing other stuff. It's like a mafia type of, you have these groups, they're sadly saying that. Uh, we, uh, we took, we went to the warehouse where you sent the stuff and uh, you know, we grabbed uh, those big duffel bags. We put some shoes in it. Some some guys uh, uh, wanted shoes in them. Uh, they asked mainly. They asked for shoes, winter stuff, and something that they could put on the ground to, to sleep on because it gets so muddy and the water rises and they can't really literally. Like you've seen a pile of uh, mattresses, yes. and, and you know, that's all because we give it to them, and the next day. It's, you know, they use it for two or three days, and the next day it's unusable anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you realize, like from the pictures, there is nowhere you could see water. 
the, the sanitation is, is unbelievable, water is scarce there, they have uh, you know, maybe a few taps around, but it's not really a clean water. So we got those duffel bags from the warehouse, we put some shoes in them, and we, come, we came back, we told a bunch of guys, just wait for us, because it's a very tough thing to distribute things. It's, you know, it's, they, they swarm at you, and if you really don't do it in a, in a like organized manner, you end up being you know, in, a, in a very tough situation. So anyhow, we told them, listen, you guys need shoes, about 10 of them. Uh, just wait for us here, we're gonna go get the shoes and come back to you. So we came back, and the guy who was standing, he said, listen, I'll help you with the shoes. I'll, I'll carry the stuff for you. I said, okay, no problem. He carried the stuff, we distributed the shoes, and he's one of the guys that wanted the shoes, and he forgot to give himself the shoes. Mm -hmm. at the end of so, um, the devastation there is, is beyond anything that you could, you could ever imagine. I mean, uh, you know, five communal areas that we're, uh, we're, uh, uh, we're building, this is just a small thing to help certain families to really, uh, you know, just put them in nice areas, they could sleep fine, uh, you know, they could cook or they could, uh, you know, study or, or that sort of thing. But the majority of people are really still need our help. Shoes, for example, is, is, is a hot item, you know, it's, it's, it's a very muddy, very, very, very tough to, to, to be in that situation. So, you've seen the good pictures. I know some of them are, are shocking, but we get more pictures that are more, you know, more graphic, meaning that we have, uh, uh, we have people on the ground in Turkey, we have people on the ground in Greece, and in Lebanon, and in Jordan, and they send us pictures, like for example, you know, uh, uh, in Syria, a few weeks ago, there was a bombing for a hospital. We got the pictures. I got the pictures from the organizations to make movies out of them. I can't show this to the public. They're, they're really very, very bloody and very graphic. So, um, the crisis is beyond, beyond description. Unless you go there and you see what's happening, you really can't grasp the full of what, what, what goes on. Um, the thing that is very depressing to me is to see a person killing another person. For what? At the end of the day. For what? Mm -hmm. You wonder, did God tell you do this? Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it's impossible for me to really imagine this. As I mentioned, my family, I have a Christian relatives, I have a, a Sunni relatives, I have a Shia relatives, right? Well, guess what? They're all in Lebanon. They hate each other. They literally hate each other. And it, I can't imagine, like I lived here for 20-some 20, 20 years, I go there to visit and I can't comprehend how can you guys, just, like, how can you do this? Like, how can a relative hate another relative? So that whole area is becoming, uh, you know, is, is, is a very devastated area. And uh, they need our help in, in any way or shape that we can help. Uh, we're traveling to Greece at the end of the week. Uh, we're going to travel after that to Lebanon and we're going to travel to Jordan and what we're doing also uh, we are uh, uh, we're forming our own NGO NGOs are good to because big organizations like Oxfam and you know and uh, you know, Care for Calais for example they want to donate money for us and they want to mm -hmm. donate goods but they don't want to give it to an individual mm -hmm. they don't want to say you know we are you know good people good hearted people and the nice thing about what we did is that we pay our own expenses and we take 100% of what's given to us and we give it to the refugees. People like that, really like that. Hey, you know, if you donate a dollar or you give a shoe or something, it's going to get to the refugees. So people like that, but the corporation can't really say, hey, look, you're a good person, but I can't really give you, you know, give you goods or money. So we're forming an NGO and it's going to include uh, some people from uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, it's going to include also people, uh, uh, we have an international uh, uh, immigration lawyer in Boston uh, is going to be also part of the NGO that's going to help us with uh, uh, laws, how do we sponsor kids, how do we bring people over here. It's a very tough situation, yeah, it's not an easy thing. If you tell me, can I sponsor a family and bring them here? No, it's not going to happen. It's just because there are so many laws, so many... Uh, uh, obstacles in, 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 in place to prevent you from doing that. So if you say, can I, uh, uh, can I, uh, you know, can I adopt a kid and bring him here? 
it's, it's just amazing to me, like, it's impossible for you to adopt a kid, impossible, because of the laws that they have in place. So, um, so I'll, uh, I'll open it to questions. Uh, this is our stories. We're doing a lot of things in the next few weeks and the next three months. The short term is to help as much as we can. The long term plan is we really want to get our jobs and just concentrate on this crisis. What, in general, what's going to happen in the next few months or uh, maybe year, uh, Europe is going to get rid of all the refugees. They're not going to have refugees, or at least they're going to have minimal. But what they're trying to do is uh, uh, limit the refugee crisis to three or four countries, Lebanon, Syria, uh, uh, Jordan, and, uh, and Turkey, and Iraq, of course, right? So, uh, but they, they're not going to have the refugee crisis. The, you won't hear a lot about it in, in, in Europe, and for many reasons, mainly political. But what you hear right now in terms of the bombing in Brussels and in, in Paris, those, yeah, innocent people died, but they're being used politically to kind of push the stuff away. So, um, any questions, anything that you guys want to ask me, I'm, I'm ready for it. What is, what is the expectation of people who are in these various camps, or your expectations for them? Are they just there to live there forever, or is there some hope on their part that they will be able to move on somewhere, or what? A very good question, yeah, very good question. So, so the expectation for the refugee themselves, like why am I in Calais? For example, I traveled from all the way from Syria to all these different countries, I lost family members in the way, and I get to Calais, so where do I, where do I go from here, right? The expectation is that they're gonna get some kind of an asylum in UK or France, but, but the doors are closed. So they got stuck. Like right now in Greece, nearby the Macedonia border, you probably know that. Right. Completely stuck. They can't return to Syria and they can't they close the borders in Macedonia, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, like all close their borders. And what's you know what's really hurtful about this is that you look at the refugees being beaten up, they're being abused, you know, it's a really, really tough situation. Like how can you like you're standing there you can't go forward, you can't go backward. Right. What happens now? Then, then, yeah. And the country is not going to give you asylum. So uh, uh, the long-term plan, I think, is to return them to Syria. But that's, you know, I mean, the Palestinian and some of, some of the uh, uh, refugees in Lebanon, for example, have been there for 60, 70 years. So uh, I know in my village in Lebanon, they're building a camp for, for Syrians. You know, and they're saying, okay, after a while we'll take that camp off when the crisis is over. But we all know it's not going to be over anytime soon. I mean, if you listen to, you, if you read some of the uh, reports like that come out of Washington, D.C., they expect that this crisis is going to go on for 10 or 15 years. I don't know what to expect, to be honest with you. I really don't have an answer for that other than, you know, they hope for asylum. That's not going to work. And they got stuck. My thing, my personal thing is, and I think all of your personal, you know, purpose here or goal is to help. We can't solve the problem, but we could help. I can't help everybody, but I can help somebody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's the whole purpose behind behind something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. I, when I look at the where they are, is there any way that infrastructure can be brought in? In other words, the roads made more sand. Um, <coughs> Do you know something about that while while they are in this terrible limbo? That's I mean I know that there's all of this other piece, but when I look at the infrastructure portion of it, I'm just curious about when Oxfam and you know Care and they the big you know yeah. those big organizations. It seems to me that there's some infrastructure that could be temporarily put in place yeah. before they. I'm just curious. Yeah, so uh, Calais and Dunkirk are a little bit different from other camps, to be honest with you. So the structure that you're talking about in Greece, for example, or in Jordan, or in Turkey, or in you know these areas, big organizations go in and 
build this stuff, right? But in Calais and Dunkirk, the French government kind of put, you know, they don't want them to settle there. They really don't want them to. So that's why you see tents and, uh, uh, and mud and, you know, no, no bathrooms or nothing, like no, no hospitals or nothing being offered by the French government to, 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 to these two camps. Mm -hmm. They don't want them there. And after, yeah, they don't want them there at all. And after the, 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 the Paris attack, they kind of gave their, themselves a license to do anything they want with these mm -hmm. refugees. Meaning, I saw the church was on grass. Yeah. So, Why not? Talk to me. so by the, by the <laughs> way, the church and the mosque were bulldozed like a few weeks ago. Oh. The Calais, the, uh, the other part of the question is the Calais uh, uh, camp. Uh, had about seven to nine thousand, depending on who you talk to. You know, had some people said four thousand, some people said seven, some people said ten thousand. You know, numbers and what's vary. The right? What's the? Um, I'm not sure to be honest with you. But they built those three quarters of the camp, and the rest of the people they just jammed into like one small area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some people are left. Some of them are uh, living right now under bridges and things like this in Paris. You know? uh, but the, the good news is that Dunkirk is being built. It was handed over to uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, and their building structures. The French government specifically didn't allow somebody like Oxfam and big organizations to come in and build anything like the Red Cross. And they don't exist there. Now, were so, those pictures mostly Calais, or were some of them Dunkirk? Both. Both. Oh, they were, and okay. yeah. So they're both similar. They were both similar at your time. Yeah. So they're 20 minutes away from each other. Right. 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 Yeah. The uh, the uh, uh, containers that, that you've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so the story behind this, those containers is uh, Dunkirk is being built, but Calais they wanted to erase it completely. So over time, I think it's going to there will there will be not. It's not going to be. There. But Dunkirk specifically is being built. Uh, the uh, containers, the story behind the containers that we had a friend in Boston uh, that went to San Francisco and uh, she called us a few days later. She said, listen, my family uh, in south, uh, southern France have a shipping company, but they have these 10 containers or so that we want to uh, use. Do you think that they, uh, they could use in Dunkirk? I said, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, we paid the money to transport them to Dunkirk. And they're being, uh, you know, what they do with them, they put two containers next to each other. I mean, if you go to, uh, if you go to these pages, to this page specifically, this one is for Dunkirk and Calais, this one is for pretty much all refugees. But you see more pictures about the, the, uh, the structure that we're building there. Two containers next to each other, we put a roof on it, and then uh, we have some really nice artists that put some graffiti and stuff like that, and then they build some kind of a structure to like, a kitchen and a, a study area and that sort of thing, and mainly built for children and women, uh, just to give them something. But uh, the project is about 10 containers to kind of build five communal areas, but at the same time, we're going to have more containers coming into in, in the next few weeks to build more structures to, uh, you know, help more people. Thank you. Is, is the Calais camp the one that used to be the one where people would come and hop on trucks to go over over to England? Yes. Is yeah. that what the initiation of that camp? Yeah. So, so that's like an old camp. Very old. That's, that's 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. It's been going a long time. Yeah. Was Dunkirk an old camp also? Uh, I've never no, heard of no. it before. Yeah, Dunkirk is totally different. It's just... It's uh, recent. It's recent and it started with the, with the Syrian crisis. Right, okay, that's what I was thinking, because the Calais one is like well known. Yeah, very well known. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, the Calais refugee camp is literally at the entrance of the Euro tunnel. Right, right. And right. the refugees used to, every on a daily basis, oh. they would uh, throw trees in the middle of the road and it would stop the traffic and they would jump on the, on the, yeah, uh, the trucks. trucks. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you're talking about seven or eight thousand people, right. and most of the time, literally ninety-nine percent of the time, they catch these people, right. and they, you know, maybe right. one person or two a yes, week, right. yeah. you know, and that's. Uh, I can't tell you the stories like like beating and yeah. spraying and you know all that no. stuff when they get the brutally like you know we saw this guy we treated this guy in, in the caravan, they ran over his legs with 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 the car. I mean, he had broken legs. Yeah. So, um, 
So it's at the entrance. They don't want it there. Right. Part it's of their been there for a long time. Yeah, so they want to get rid of it so they don't really have to deal with the problem anymore. Yeah, understand that. <clears throat> yeah. So clearly, in terms of the immediate uh, situation, what's needed is help through these organizations and through others to, to help these individuals who are stuck in limbo. Yeah. Um, for the longer term, getting back to the earlier question, where, where does one or where do groups apply political pressure to try to find solutions? So, uh, so part of what we do, what part of, uh, we, we just started with this stuff, right? And part of what we do is to build as many connections as we can. From the connections that we have on the ground in, Paris, in, in France and UK, they, uh, uh, they, pressure, they pressure their MPs in their own way. We pressure our own congressmen and you know, house speakers in our own way. You know, you contact your house speaker, say, listen, why are you not doing anything about it, right? My, uh, uh, you know, I'm a computer engineer, so I could really send out, you know, in my own way, I could send out, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, communique about the situation. Like, if, like, you have to contact, for example, if you've seen in the slide, uh, we contacted um, congressmen, NGOs, NPR, we contacted other organizations to work with them, you know, uh, so you build connections with, like, for example, like carrying me home and, and, and you help out. You don't need to help me. You don't need to help my organization. You don't need to help her organization. But, you know, if you have some kind of a, uh, a way of contacting the people around and help, then you could, you could do that. The, the major thing for us is, uh, in the U.S., people don't know about this stuff. And the more that people know about this stuff, maybe it will become some kind of a movement that we could pressure our officials to do something about it, maybe accept more people and, and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the problem is twofold. If I say to you, uh, let's pressure our government officials to accept 10,000 people, right? Well, you know, I gotta be honest, you have to be careful about you know, who you're letting in first. So they go through this rigorous, rigorous, like very hard uh, uh, process. Uh, we had a person who applied for asylum over here, and they gave him an interview in 2022. Right. 2022. So where are you going to wait between now and, and, and 22? It's, mm. it's very... Uh, so the answer to your question is it's a very long process to really do anything about it. The way you can help these people is by providing the immediate needs, like clothes and, and, and shoes and food and that sort of thing. But can I help them beyond that? I could pressure uh, powerful people to do something about it, but it's a very complicated thing. It's a $4.3 trillion problem. So it's not, uh, you know, me and you can't solve it, but we can help. This is uh, probably, you know, I'm sure it's related to what you were just talking about, but there's been almost a deafening silence, if you know in this country about this issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I'm wondering if, why that is. Is it because we're in a different political, what's your read on it? Is it because we're in a different political situation? Is it because our government has not wanted to be involved particularly? Or, how do you think about it? It's like everything else in this, like, you know, you literally, you drive to Canada, you hear different stories, like, you know, it's totally different from what you hear in here. It seems that it's not only the refugee crisis, everything else that we deal with in life over here, some kind of a, hey, let's keep people in the dark type of thing, right? Hard to... I personally think that has, to, that has something to do with, you know, with 9-11 and the blame, you know, for all the attacks, and people are afraid, you know, and that's why we have that that scrutiny of like, checking everyone that's coming here. We all, and we all want to be safe here, right? So it's, it's a very hard kind of a, an issue. I mean, I'm from Europe, so I know what people in Europe are saying. Are saying. Like Polish people, they don't want, you know, um, the refugees there because they are different, you know, culture, different religion. And the religion is a big issue for them. 
um, and I feel like it's kind of similar here. Like we want to help, but we're like, we're not sure. Like you know, we want them now, but let's check them carefully. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's like people are kind of in in between. Like they do want it, but they don't want it. So it's like a it's a problem because, and I think the, the government and the officials probably don't want to just stand up and say, you know, let's do it because there are a lot of people that are against it. Mm -hmm. So I think I, that's what I think it is. People I want to help, but they are afraid at the same time. I think it's like a very, you know, people don't know where, where they are standing. But, but, the, but the, you know, the disappearance of 10,000 children, mm -hmm. somebody, I think, I mean, I, I think that that's maybe a different matter than getting um, what do I say? Do you know what I mean? Going for immigration. I mean, I, it shouldn't be. I, yeah. But I feel like your point is, I never knew this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so coming here, I find out that there are these 10,000 missing children, and I never read it in the newspaper. I never saw it in this. No one was talking about it. Yeah. So I think, you know, I mean, Jimmy, your point about this is I feel like that is, is a communicate. The communique here is about our not doing anything. Every day, children are being lost and trafficked. Yeah. And so we've got this whole thing about trafficking here. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like those are the organizations, I would say. I mean, at least in that one area. I don't mean about not all of the help that you're talking about. But if there's some political push to me, it would be lambasting all of our, I mean, if I could get it, you know, just that information sort of in a communique, I would be, I, I know that there are people within the Congress that don't know this. I, 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 I don't know. No, we, on our page, we, we update people all the time, but you, you have to be part of something like that. Yes. You have to be either, you know, you have to like a, a Facebook page of an organization like ours, or, I mean, there's really no idea. You're not going to read too much in a newspaper about it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to read about the negatives. I mean, not the negative, but something that yes. directly affects us, but not something that's far away, and that's another issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you have to be part of, you know, on, on Facebook pages or a website of those kind of organizations to, to find out. Otherwise, you won't. Mm -hmm. uh, let's be honest with each other. Like, who is the cause of all of the devastation that is going on? Mm -hmm. Who is the cause of it? Big companies, big countries, you know, people didn't want to really fight each other like this and kill each other like this. So, uh, it's politics, mm -hmm. part of it. That they don't want people to know about what's going on over there. Just, hey, worry about your football game and worry about mm -hmm. your, you know, mm -hmm. what does Trump say and what does Bernie <laughs> yeah. Sanders say and, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, I mean, I have, sadly, I have my children know more about music and stuff like this, but more like, you know, if I want to educate them, but there's, I, I can't show them this stuff. So it's a very, you know, there isn't really a movement around, around the country. No. You have to really target news organizations that are affect. you know, news organizations, they put stuff out there, but they put stuff that are interesting to people, or at least programmed in a certain way to keep you in a certain place, mm -hmm. and um, and then that's that's sad. That's that's really sad. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, on a somewhat positive note, uh, are you aware of this uh, general? There was a man in in England who was uh, uh, a, a he was uh, a Jewish Jew, a Jewish child who was brought to England and grew up in England at, at the time of the, uh, of the Holocaust. That he has taken upon himself to persuade the British government to take in at least 400 children from the Calais, and it's halfway through the, their their government. They've got part of the government approved it, and they're working on the other other part. You know, to there's the Lords and there's the Commoners, and and it's halfway through. And it's, if they if they do approve, then at least 400 children will be. Of those children from Calais will be will be brought to England. Are you aware of that? Pro of yes, that yes, project? that's that's very true. And yes, and they approved it recently. To uh, and he's I think it because he himself was saved as a child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the honest truth is that uh, you know I have a, a friend uh, called Carrie Neftali. She's an Israeli, right? She's so she's traveling to Greece tomorrow, 
right, to help out. And she does the same thing that you do. She ships containers to Greece and Turkey and, and Jordan and, you know. So when I say that the, the, the people that are helping, that there are no religious effort, like meaning, listen, I'm a Muslim, you're a Christian or you're Jewish, or that's what I mean. You don't see that over there. And that's the nice thing about, about this whole crisis, that people from all walks of life are helping. Um, and there are Jewish organizations, there are Christian organizations that are helping, there are Muslim organizations that are helping. A lot of people are helping. Uh, but for, you know, when it comes to officials and yeah. government, you, know, you, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see that. Yes. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, for uh, the uh, importance of focusing on some of these uh, very specific issues within the larger problem. Um, your pictures, incredible pictures, of families and children living in such impossible situation, that's something that could appeal. Uh, the idea of 10,000 missing children, my goodness. Uh, the idea of trying to resettle and relocate some of these children, yes. Um, when you look at the, the larger question of, quote, Syrian refugees, um, this country is, is not in receptive mode. I saw a poll recently where a higher proportion of Americans favor restrictions on Muslims than the percentage of Americans that support Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, that's really scary stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, when they look at the Syrian situation, they say, well, serves them right. Middle Easterners mm -hmm. killing Middle Easterners, uh, Muslims, Muslims killing and, and expelling Muslims, they deserve each other. Let them, uh, let them suffer, let them stew. Uh, it's it's not a receptive environment. So maybe you know maybe these comments are right that we've got to hone in on places where just as human beings we can't help but respond. Uh, if you notice one of the pictures, uh, uh, there's a sentence there: "Are you crazy to take your child with you?" Mm -hmm. I guarantee, if I put the picture of my child next to that, they look exactly so similar. Mm -hmm. And when I put his picture on Facebook, the guy, my friend, wrote me back, said, are you crazy to take your child with you to this, this area? Because he just didn't realize that that wasn't my child. Mm -hmm. And every time I remember that statement, I, uh, I just, I just, like, uh, I don't have words to describe this stuff. And I don't have, I, I don't know, can I help these people other than going there and take some goods and, and maybe money and that sort of thing? Uh, I maybe, but right now God gave me the ability to just go there and help. Maybe tomorrow He'll say, "Okay, you're going to become the president of the United States." <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get any votes in Vermont versus Bernie uh, Sanders, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not a receptive, a receptive place for for this stuff. I mean, there's so much uh, phobia about. You know about non-Americans. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say uh, you know uh, only Muslims, but yeah. It's been feeding the fear. Of, it's fear has been fed. That's what I'm going to say, of yeah. many different kinds. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I do think more people want to help than are speaking up now, but they feel totally helpless. Yeah. I mean, part of what you pointed out here, you're trying to give avenues to help. But there's a lot that you are saying and others are saying, nothing can be done. And in the face of that, and in the face of that kind of helplessness, people pull back into themselves. And so I think anything your organization that can do to say, OK, you can't do it all now, but here are some steps you can do for the time being, help. Yeah. And by the way, you have jars here to collect. <coughs> donations for these organizations. Don't leave the room without noticing them. Um, the, do, you, do you see what I mean? I think um, 
we don't need to demonize a lot of Americans because a lot of Americans feel totally helpless to do anything about what looks like an insoluble problem. Yeah. So we need to give small steps that can be done, itemize how those small steps may lead to something good in the future. Karen, you were talking about infrastructure that can be built in the mud sewer pots of those camps, etc. You know, one of the organizations we work with, I mentioned, Karen, uh, are you serious? They're actually building right now infrastructure in uh, Idomeni, in Greece. Uh, mm -hmm. They're building tents with floor, wooden floors, and they actually um, they collected um, some items uh, from artists, um, and they uh, sold that and gathered twenty-six thousand dollars. So they were able to buy a lot of supplies and building, you know, tents with wooden floors, and so that's the way to mm -hmm. do it. But it it just requires a lot of money. Um, but just by you kind of saying that, you know, um, it's hard to see that, that by, by doing a little bit, you not helping that big picture. On our website alone, like we try to post, the volunteers send us pictures all the time, and we ask for it. Obviously, like, can you send us pictures, like when you're, you know, delivering stuff, or like, you know, and it's just so rewarding to see that. Like, I've seen actually my own clothes a few times. You know, my, my kids' clothes, right? It's just so rewarding to see that when you see smile on, on the child's face, you know, when, when he has a hat on, it's warm. And it's kind of like, really, so when you go on our page and you see all these different pictures of, of happy people, at least for those few moments when they're getting warm clothes or, or baby carriers, when they can carry the baby, it's so rewarding. You know, so kind of it makes you feel like you're doing something. Yeah. So to your point, yes, a lot of people want to help. A lot of Americans want to help. From my own story, is that we started this in, in December, right? We're talking about three months. Within three months, uh, you know, we did presentation at Harvard, Tufts, did here, we did in some churches. People, when they hear this, they want to help. A lot of good people that want to help, but everyone in their own way, they want to help. So how can you help? Right? You, you said, give me steps. You have people here that could, you could uh, you either donate money or donate goods, right? Or if you are influential in some fashion, you think you could really uh, uh, raise the issue with more people or more officials. Or that's other, that's, those are the three steps right now that we could do, at least as me and you. Yes, sorry. Oh, there's somebody over there. No. I just wanted to say how impressed I am with the two of you. You know, having families and just making this a priority of your lives. Thank you. For you. I was just going to add a fourth one onto what the three that you said, which is um, like listening to the conversation. I'm thinking about how important it is that we keep educating other people in the community because the only way, and beyond our own community, because it seems to me the only way to break down the biases that you're talking about is for people to to actually learn yeah. and to realize that these are human beings and that they may have biases coming from the press or coming from fears or whatever. Mm -hmm. and and breaking those biases down, it, like to me, that's like part of how we're going to actually change the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is why I'm glad you're here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, adding on to what Ellen said, I think we all need to get away from the mainstream media mm -hmm. and read other sources. You can start with The Guardian in England, where you get a better picture. And there are so many things online where you can read what's going on in the world. For example, I don't know how many of you know that there are two groups fighting in Syria. One gets their weapons from the Pentagon, and the other gets their weapons from the CIA. And they're fighting each other. You know, it, if you get in touch with me, I'll send you the link. I've read this a couple of times now. And, you know, for me personally, I feel very guilty as an American because I feel that um, it's our government and our corporations that are at the root of all this suffering. And that's why I'm in, involved in this because um, we just, another world is possible. Yeah. It can be better. Well, speaking of something 
that you can do relating to the Muslim biases. There is something at the Root Justice Center tomorrow at 10 a.m., <clears throat> which is uh, writing letters to my Muslims, Muslims that I love. love. And it's a letter writing <clears throat> campaign at 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Root Justice Center, <clears throat> 38 William Street. You had a question. Uh, it was just more of a comment. I mean, it's so very complicated. I mean, the reason there's so many of them backed up on the English Channel is that all the other countries let them go through with the idea that they would not stay in their country. Yeah. And then the reason they're all backed up now at Greece and other places, they're saying, no, we're not going to accept them and we don't want you to let them transport or go across your boundaries. And, you know, I was reading today in the Wall Street Journal, they think uh, Merkel, Prime Minister Merkel, is going to lose her job because she's been so generous to refugees. I mean, it's just, and it's not as simple as what she just remarked. It's much more complicated in Syria. I mean, they want more arms from the U.S. They want us, I mean, we're at a point now where they're like quoting Vietnam, we're going to destroy Syria to save it. I mean, it, it's very complicated between the Kurds and the Turkey and, you know, who's going to end up with what there. And so I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm so touched by, I think so many people in their hearts and their families would help someone. And it's so hard, and that's why I think, like you said, you know, the work that you're doing is kind of like that link between here I am sitting in Brattleboro saying, well, I would help somebody if I could. And they're over there saying, I need some help. And it's hard to make that connection. I mean, and that's why both of you are to be commended. I mean, because how else would we do it? Our government say, like I say, I will help one person, but our government says we can't help a half a million. Yeah. We can't have a half a million refugees come in. I mean, it's just not feasible, not possible, whatever you, you want to say. So I think it's, it's so complicated. I mean, it's a, if there was an easy answer, like more arms or less arms or whatever, I mean, I think people would do it, but there isn't one. I mean, it's very difficult. The, the, you know, they're leaving Syria. It, they have to remember that the leader of Syria was poisoning their people. I mean, there's a reason they're leaving Syria, and it's not just, it's, it's beyond that. So that's all I wanted to say. And I, you know, I, w I would like so much if uh, uh, United Kingdom, you know, Dunkirk was that great evacuation of the British Army with the fishing boats of southern England. Uh, you know, I just wish in my romantic mind that that would happen again, that they would go over there and rescue these families. Yeah. And I believe there's probably a village in every village in the United Kingdom, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Northern Ireland, that would take a family. Mm -hmm. The trick is how do you do, how do you go from there to that village to take one family? Uh, it's an extremely, extremely complicated problem. And if you realize in Sweden or, or Scotland, they did what you, what you, what you did just described. Yeah. They took about 11,000 family in, right? Each house just took a family into their house and they, uh, they took care of them. But then you're talking about thousands and thousands. You're talking about millions of people. I mean, yeah. we, we simply can't you know, take in that many people. And then you hear a hundred, I don't know how many Muslim men in Hamburg on New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve, wherever, and they, they acted out terribly sexually in the crowds. And of course, that's the headline for three days. There's no, I mean, it's, it's just hard to deal with it. I mean, it's just hard to understand all of that. They, uh, like, for example, uh, they concentrate when it comes to Muslim stuff, mm. they concentrate on the negative mm -hmm. versus, you know, you have hundreds of people. Thousands of people are doing really good stuff on the ground that are Muslims, right? But then there are hundreds of people, thousands of people that are Jewish, that are doing a lot of good things. So they, they seem to hear, they concentrate on the negative, and they don't concentrate on the positive that people really, you know, could do. Well, thank you so much for what thank you doing. Thank you for that. Fascinating. When you go back to Lebanon, you have three parts of your family who all don't get along with each other. And isn't that the crux of it? I mean, if, if they could all respond to this through you, wouldn't that bring them together? Wouldn't that? Um, so the other day I was uh, reading uh, a book, right? 
it's a visual history of Lebanon. And it's a 50 pages book, a very small book, right? And it goes back to 5,000 years, five or 6,000 years, and it tells you the, you know, the different times that Lebanon has gone through, right? Um, um, there has been killing and occupying, and somebody's attacking somebody for 5,000 years. It's religiously driven, it's politically driven, and if you think about it, that's what the world is, is like since the dawn of history. Somebody's killing somebody, somebody's occupying somebody. I thank God, and I'm on the right side trying to help. I mean, you should also, you know, if you're good about yourself, that you're trying to help. You're not trying to kill, like you're not trying to harm somebody on the other side. And that's, in essence, that's the good and evil, right? You know, but I, I can't, I can't, I can't change it. Right. It, it, like, I, I'm, oh, sorry, I'm labeled as an American over there. Oh, here comes the American, you know, and, and there's so much hate for Americans over there. So I don't, oh, you don't like it, you guys don't know anything, you know, but then, you know, you come to talk to my family, no, 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 you don't understand the situation over here, you know. It's, it's hopeless to me, to be honest with you. But, you know, we should never forget that the Protestants and the Catholics went on for a hundred years. France and Germany fought endlessly. Yeah. Wars. Thirty-year wars. Hundred-year wars. And yet, now we couldn't imagine it. We couldn't imagine France invading Germany or Germany, you know what I mean, quite frankly. It's, it's sort of, and I think it's just, I hate to say, it's a matter of time for some of this to work out. Now, I, I realize that Sunnis and the Shiites have been at it for a long, long time. <laughs> I, yeah, but at some point, it, there, there is a point where they work together. I mean, you know, they can live together. And I think the trick is it's sort of figure out, I mean, we can look at the South Sudan. You want to talk about, you know, people dying. Well, I mean, you would look at Gaza. We go to Gaza. You want to see people living in a horrible situation. I mean, it's like, it, I think that the time between where it is and where you would like it to be, that transitional time, is when children get crushed when people get killed. And that's really what you, you, we need to do, yeah. is see if we can alleviate that between the time now and the time maybe when there's a change. So I'll leave, the, uh, there is a beautiful verse in the Quran, and I read something very similar in the Bible also, and in the, in, in the Torah, that talks about when, when civilization or people get to that level of corruption, God does not really send on them anymore, like hellfire or anything like that, but he just leaves them alone and come up with a new generation that he loves and they love. So I think that's a solution. We look at our, like I look at my children and I say they are the hopeful of the, of the future. I concentrate on them. Try to really build their minds because it's hard for me to go and change somebody who's 60 and 70 years old, right? But I could really influence my kid. My kid is in a school uh, he's, a, he's a Muslim, right? He has an Israeli friend, right? He has a Christian friend, he has a black friend, he has a... So he has a Chinese friend in the school, so... And it's hard for him to comprehend Sunnah Shi'i, Christian, you know, it's hard for him to... He, does, it does, he doesn't really get it. That's great. That's, I think, my hope for the future, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you.